everyone. Hello. Welcome oh. to the last well fed. Exactly. Well, yeah. nice. <laughs> You've set a standard. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Standard. We're going to remember for next year. Um, so let's get right into it. We've got five speakers today. Um, we're going to change the rate. We're going to jump up um, above Andrew. Yeah. Andrew, you okay? Um, I just wanted to quickly have a look at um, how we're getting academics to use e-learning and Moodle and things like that. What we're doing in law, I'll quickly have a look at, but my emphasis for my presentation is more on um, what are we doing to get academics into this. Okay? So at the law school, I think the metaphor that keeps coming up again and again is you can eat a horse water, but you can't make a drink. Right? And I was thinking when I was putting this presentation together, why is that? Why don't the academics come into this? So I think the, in law school there's obviously the pressures of research. Um, you know, when they finish teaching a teaching block, they do research. So they're not really interested in um, going away and learning how to use Moodle, that kind of thing. They're very time poor when they are teaching. So if you say to them, why don't you do forums in law teaching, they're like, where I'm going to find time for that. So um, there's an element of fear of technology, I think, with academics here. They look at Moodle and go, it's just too much, I can't deal with it. Um, and perhaps they're happy with the current state of teaching. They, they're getting cat's eye results that are pretty good. They're sitting there and, and doing face to face and going, why would I bother to, to um, integrate e learning into my course? Um, some of them are just unwilling to change. I think they're couple with one four, they're happy with current states, their own ones change. And did I mention they're time poor? <laughs> so they're very, very time poor. So my job, I think in the law school and probably in other faculty as well with you guys, is to change this metaphor from when you lead a horse to water becoming a drink to you can lead a horse to water and he'll jump on the surfboard and go and ride the wave. <laughs> like that. So <laughs> So, again, as I was putting this presentation together, I was thinking, how can we do that? So, um, I think the academics don't understand the change that's happening around them, to some extent. And they're, they're teaching in a certain way, they're happy with what they're doing, but things around them are changing and they're not keeping up with that, I think, they don't understand that. So I think that part of my strategy for next year will be um, changing that understanding of um, and we are taking steps to do that. Um, they need to be willing to take risks in their teaching to go out and say, I've never done this kind of thing before, I'm going to grab it, pull it into my teaching and see what happens. Um, I think the fundamental change that needs to happen is a change in thinking actually about teaching. Because at the moment, I've said this to a few people before, but I think at the moment with e-learning in maybe across UNSW, but particularly in law, um, is that it's, it's a plug-in at the moment. And they're doing their teaching, and we're trying to plug e-learning into it. But they don't have time for this. And it, I think if there's a fundamental change in the idea of teaching that you know, we need to um, get students into communities of learners here, we, need, we can use technology to do that. Um, it doesn't have to be, if not here, it's not lecture style, but it doesn't have to be um, you know, learning in isolation, and we can use technology to change that. Um, I need to get the academics here to embrace e-learning as a valid teaching methodology because they don't see it that way, I think. A lot of them don't. Some of them do, but others don't. And some of them will pick a little bit out of the um, Moodle activities, for example, forums, but they, they won't really work with it because I don't think they believe it. So in some ways I have to change this kind of thinking. And um, get them also to experiment with Moodle functions as a precursor to using them successfully. Okay. Um, that's self-explanatory. So that's a big challenge, I think, and there's a lot, there's a lot to do in there because it, for me, it's about a fundamental change. When I stood here last year, I've been in this job for three months, I think, and I basically said to you guys, and I'll show you the video for a little bit. I said to you guys, um, you know. Uh, they're just not accepting what's going on here, and I, I'm not quite sure how to um, change all this, but I think I've got a better idea now, and the idea is that 
it has to be a fundamental change in thinking rather than trying to plug it in. And so, how, how are we going to do that? The strategy for 2014, what we did this year, um, I set up a, a Moodle site called Moodle Central, which um, we wanted all the academics to come into to discuss and use Moodle as a platform to discuss their teaching and also to um, give them information about Moodle. It, it was a little bit successful, but not grandly successful. We only launched about two months ago, but um, we even offered an iPad for Christmas to the person who was in there the most and giving the most information, and that's going to go out in a couple of weeks to the person who was in there the most. We chucked in a forum for if you have any educational questions about using e-learning in your teaching, post them up here, and John and I are now working on making small screen capture videos to address those questions. So that, I think that's a, a core one for 2014 because it did draw a lot of the academics in. Many of them have come in there and only looked, looked at it once, but there are a group of about 12 or 15 who have come in there and they're using it to talk to each other, so that's quite, that's quite good. We had a champions model, um, and I, I don't think it was successful, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we use communications, newsletters, emails, and it, it all boiled down to, in the end, one-on-one -on -one consultations were the most successful because when you're sitting with them with the screen up, you can say, this is how it works, this is what's happening, blah, blah, blah. If we have, I guess one's training, if we had training, uh, I organized probably about uh, 10 training sessions last year, and three or four, a handful of academics turned up, so it was effectively leading a horse to water. You know, it doesn't matter how much you say, it's going to be fantastic, we've got cakes and, you know, a handful turn up, so, what have you? Um, so it ended up the most successful <coughs> was definitely one-on-one -on -one when they had to come to you because their students were complaining or they or they wanted to do something and they'd say, um, can you help me with this? We'd sit down and chuck out a lot of other ideas around that. Um, we did an assessment, we, we had a focus on um, assessment this year. Um, using Turnitin. So in 2013, um, we made it compulsory for all academics to use Turnitin, or all students to use Turnitin. So, um, which was fantastic. So they all had to learn about Turnitin. So we had an assessment where we gave, um, it ended up not being one, one academic, but we trialed um, using tablets because one of the um, uh, complaints from the academics about the marking online was that it was too hard on their eyes and they also wanted to sit down in their local park or their local cafe and, and mark their essays in the cafe. So we had trials here with tablets, um, different kinds of tablets. The iPad won through absolutely because it, it's got the um, plug in. Plug in. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it actually really, really works. So one of the academics used it, he was on a plane going somewhere, he marked all things on the plane and then synchronized everything when he landed, which was fantastic. So I think iPads for online marking are very good to push out. We did student forums and surveys. I wanted this year to get a student voice in here so that the academics would see that things are changing. We had a student forum, a panel of six students. Um, they came in and I uh, moderated it and we just asked them questions about where they're coming from as far as technology goes, what's happening here, what, are, what were their attitudes about technology use and we got some surprising results. We also, we also started surveys in semester one this year so we've had two now and, and hopefully over time we're going to see a change in attitudes and stuff. And I just, I wanted to put, I know this is a horrible slide, but I just wanted to quickly have a look at the survey because it's actually quite interesting in law where the student, what the students are thinking about as far as technology. So look at that, most are using laptops, only 33 are using desktops now in, in our cohort. What that means to me is um, it's mobile, it's going mobile. 45% uh, are using their mobile phones, so maybe they're watching videos on the bus, maybe they're um, reading stuff on the bus on their iPads or anything. Um, so do we need to start tailoring content to mobile, obviously? Um, Moodle features, 92% submitting assessments online was very valuable. Um, they, they don't want to come up, they don't want to get on the bus, come in, hand in an assignment in a little slot and then get it back with red marks that they can't really read and things like that. I think a lot of them now are tending towards getting feedback online. 
Um, only 50% thought forums were valuable, but 20% said they hadn't used them. So <laughs> that, the statistics were a little skewed, I think. And around 50% found doing online activities valuable. So quizzes and kind of thing. Um, and just for example, the use of Moodle and all courses helped you. 65% said Moodle hasn't helped them effectively communicate with their teacher. And 67 said it hasn't helped them collaborate with this with fellow students. Mm -hmm. So, and that's something that I need to improve. So hopefully in the stats from these surveys, I, I'll hopefully be able to see it improving on that over time. Because we want, this is the core for me of Moodle, is getting people in, in communities of learners and um, collaborating with each other online. So that was nearly 70% said so they're not collaborating with their peers at all. Uh, what else? Before they kind of come in here, six five percent have used the LMS before, sixty percent have used online collaboration tools for like discussion forums and online quizzes. Uh, so you know quite a few of them are coming in with technology use. So strategy 2015, again it's a fundamental change. So I'm looking at structural change. You know, and I think I have to get management buy-in with this. It's got to come from the top. To say, as, as we did with Turnitin, to say you have to now submit your assignments with Turnitin. We may go the direct or I'm going to try to push the direction of um, you must mark online. Or not must mark online, but um, you, there is an opt out, but we strongly. How can you say it? We strongly suggest <laughs> iPads for everyone. <laughs> So we're going to have to find a way, I think, for more top-down um, change or pressure. Champion Spotlight, as I said before, the Champions model I think didn't work too well for us because there wasn't enough spotlight on it and there wasn't communicated enough, so we'll be looking more about that. Um, developing Moodle Central with John making videos, we'll, we'll probably work over the next few months to get those really funky and really good, so the, the um, purpose of those was to have kind of, um, as we need information, easily plucked. So if you need um, me to set up a forum, or I need to know what's the point of the forum, there's that information, you click on it, and someone will tell you straight away. Um, we're going to focus on certain activities, forums are the obvious one, maybe quizzes this year, I'm excited. And we're going to develop these other forms of technology, video, audio, SCORM packages, start to get them involved in that for um, you know, learning learning sequences, that kind of thing. Just bought a very nice camera. We just bought a very nice computer which will uh, be able to render all that information. And more student input, getting the students with a bigger voice in here. So th that's our strategy. Um, we're also, uh, I'm managing a project at the moment. It's a one year project to create legal research and writing modules. So I'm looking at um, creating very personalized learning systems where, where there are, um, the, the student comes in with a diagnostic assessment um, and they go into different pathways or they, there's an informal form of assessment area where there are 12 or 15 modules at the top and they can go into these different modules. The formative assessment points to the summative assessment and it's all based around the resources. I don't know that made this total teaching sense, but um, we want to automate a lot of this and put it in, in use technology to deliver a lot of this because, um, um, again, the academics are time poor and we're, we're going to try and free up a lot of their time to, to concentrate on other things and allow the students to actually go in and pick what they need for their particular course. In this course, in particular, we have really a range of students in the cohort. We've got academics coming, or sorry, um, students coming from Europe who are, have work with possibly with law before or been in the university system for a long time. They know about referencing, they know everything about this. Why would you sit and have them listen to someone or do exercise about referencing and they know about it? So we can just bump them straight into other areas very quickly as they need it and then um, all based around resources. The resources are going to go up on a website, we're going to have an external website for that rather than use internal and so that um, it's open to the world. The modules will be open to the world. Anyone can use them from other law faculties. So that's a kind of new, it's probably for you guys, not so new, but for here it's kind of new. Um, and that's me in a nutshell. So, just a quick question about the 
survey, Thomas? <coughs> Did you um, organise the survey to support the changes you were bring about, or was it something within the dean or the board? No, I organised it. Um, to um, and what, what yeah, you exactly to take to the academics and say, look, this is what's happening. Okay. So you've got support from you? Yes, um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thompson, a question and then a comment. Um, yeah. the, the question is, does the faculty itself have you know, an e-learning strategy or does it have something that's formulated that then ha you know, has the status of, okay, this is what we're on about, you know, our academic performance reviews at the end of the year, we're right. going to be judged on, you know, what our use is, what our learning capability, you know, what our teaching and learning capabilities are, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's my question, but my comment is partially, I suppose, linked to that. In, I think there were two, a um, couple of things that struck me about what you were saying. One is you kept on saying, you felt it was your responsibility to do some of this, and while I accept that to some extent, I don't to a large extent because it's the responsibility. I mean, people have to take personal responsibility right. for adapting and changing, and I think don't take too much on yourself. You yes. can't blame yourself for that. Yes, 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 yes. But thinking about it from a marketing perspective in terms of you've identified something that is critical, which is time for. Mm -hmm. To me, what I would also say is, okay, then sell the benefits. Anyone who's been told to do something always has an internal voice that says, what's in it for me? Yeah. And if you can link on what's in it for you by using X, Y, and Z, or by doing this, this is going to free up your time for research or for development or for something else. Yeah. For example, your example about the online, you know, someone sitting on a plane doing their marking. If you can find a few more case studies like that and then use them to sell the benefits of what you're trying to introduce, I think it would be really useful. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's a little bit of the management thing as well. We, we've got one academic here who is doing an intensive course and they, I think, you know, they're doing four days or something and he cleared off one of the days to do e-learning and they got paid the same. Mm -hmm. and so that kind of thing has come from, from above to say, okay, you could do exactly. that um, and use the time to create these kind of e-learning things. Your question, um, the faculty does have an idea but um, I'm the person who's executing that idea, and it's, it's a very loose idea, I think. There's, there's, there's a lot of support here for it, um, but, and you know, a lot of the academics are coming into the program and you know, looking at it, dipping their toes in the water, but it could go a lot faster than mine. Well, you mentioned champions. Yeah. Champions, 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 champ
it's, it's got to be a fundamental change in ideas. Mm. I think that, that e-learning is here, it's upon us. Yeah. We have to start engaging with it. Um, the students are expecting it. It is a, it's a valid teaching methodology. It's, it's a fantastic mm. Mm. Uh, methodology we have to. Yeah. I, I'd like to add to that conversation. <coughs> um, I think what I presented last year, we were at, uh, I said we were at Tipping Point, and we've gone over. Now, I think it all comes down to understanding human behaviour and motivation, and the context in which you're working. But essentially, academics sort of work to, to similar stresses, and they also work to similar um, rewards. And from our perspective, we'll be very long fishing line right. for a very long time encouraging, um, you know, change champions on a low level, all of that sort of stuff. But there, if, if I was to take a realistic view of it, the systems and technologies didn't support the level of engagement that we were asking. Because when you look at a cost-benefit analysis, you had to overcome barriers, malfunction, Know, lack of knowledge, all of those sorts of things. So it's about knowing when your systems are mature enough, when your um, <coughs> management is prepared to resource and recognise, and when your change champions are ready to expose themselves and to share. And I wouldn't be going for one approach. I, I really think that what brought us to tipping point was an amalgam. It was getting to the point where they just can't drag this out any longer. I'm going to throw everything at it. So, like, really pressuring management for resources, re aggressively engaging change champions, seeing their praises, presenting it at every you know opportunity you had, getting external validation, and that that's one thing that I think we as a group could do for each other. And that is, as a group of people involved in um, learning and teaching. We could be choosing an initiative, not, not in the formal ways, but saying we want to give at this sort of forum some awards every year for people that we think slogged away and did you know, great things or did something at a really high level or gave the engagement. So it's some, some recognition and reward. And I found that it wasn't That's any one idea. of them. That is a fantastic idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. External validation within faculty. Within from faculty, within the <coughs> university itself, yeah. getting them up in the newsletters, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Because within the faculty, people can hide. Yeah. Once they start, start to see that their work is visible mm -hmm. and rewarded, then your internals, your management gets engaged. Ooh, it's affecting our reputation, all of that sort yeah. of stuff. That was the way I experienced it. And I'm talking. We did a decade of slow burn. Right. Put one year of chucking everything at it, at every and it's went up the tip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, sorry, sorry, that's half an hour. I'm supposed to do it. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dean, you're next. Yeah. <laughs> you okay, well, my, one will be quite a short one. Uh, I, I'm just going to say actually, I was just on that topic, I think that topic around a strategy, an e-learning strategy is I think a very worthwhile one having. Um, our, our, our strategy is more, let's um, encourage e-learning and blended learning and, and, and hope for the best kind of thing. Um, and, um, but yeah, I think we, 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 we've got a lot of ideas, but we haven't really got any formal um, strategy. Uh, our only rule uh, towards academics is that they have a Moodle space and their course outline and contact information. And so that's the minimum they have to have. Uh, but beyond that, there's, there's no real um, requirements. So uh, what I thought I'd do today is I'll just show you some of the tools that we use, or just mainly some reporting uh, that we, we're starting to use to evaluate where we are and try to actually, maybe, and perhaps uh, it will facilitate a, a strategy. So uh, we started, with Blackboard in 2010, as a that was when it became a requirement for everyone to have a, a an online presence and have their course outlines up, and we started off by doing just a a basic uh, manual audit of looking at all the courses and seeing what tools are being used, 
And, um, and so we, just to get a sense of, of, of the most popular ways that people are, are using the, the LMS. And we, you can see the, the majority are just using it as a, their website for, for resources. That's the, the, um, uh, over 80%. This is uh, from 2013. I haven't actually developed the, the uh, 2014 one yet. Um, but uh, I'm sure it's, it's still very much the same. Uh, they used announcements, discussion forums to some lesser degree, the Grade Centre and Turnitin. So those were the, the main ones. You can see not, uh, less than 10% are actually using things like Turnitin. And that's, that's, this is the biggest one. So there are people that are using blogs and other things, but that's uh, much smaller. Um, so that, this is how it's actually uh, changed over the years in, um, in terms of the different uh, categories. So in terms of content, it hasn't changed all that much. Uh, announcements, it's gone up and down. I always find that in semester two, you can see it goes down a bit on semester two, always seems that semester one, people are much more active, <laughs> and then suddenly semester two drops off, they lost their enthusiasm or what's happened there. But um, it's, it's almost consistent that there's a drop in almost everything over in semester two. Uh, the grade centre, it's uh, also up and down. Discussion forums went down. Um, it started off like maybe there was a bit of enthusiasm when we first started and then it went down and now we're climbing up again. At least we're starting to get people experimenting more with different tools and different uh, functionality. So that's what, what I call extended use. So they're going beyond just having uh, uh, websites or resources. So if they're having other tools, they're using at least two things. So maybe a discussion forum and some other tool. And um, and that's and then so that's extensive use. Um, or amount of people that are using uh, are actually quite active in, in having an, uh, the online activity. So we are, that has actually increased since we first started. Uh, now what I thought I'll, I'll do is show um, the you know, this Julia reporting system and how that can help. I'll have to log back on because it's logged me out. Um, I actually was just speaking to some people, the bridge people, uh, today. It's my uh, my junior access, um, and I'm, because I'm a, a bit of an hourly in terms of my role. I do teaching as well as the, the sort of professional side of the support side of things for to work on the TELT, and so that actually creates some complications or confusions for some, uh, about my what access should I, I should have. So for, at the moment, I'm my my TELT access is not actually, uh, it needs to be changed because you know, within the Julia report because it's, it's not actually loading everything for me. But that's, uh, I'll, I'll show you something in here, but it's, not, uh, it's, it's a bit incomplete. Uh, if you've got a number of um, reports that you can use for um, looking at LMS usage. These earlier reports, um, all the ones with LMS are actually older ones and I've been told that they're not really updating and they, the information the data they may not be current, and so they, it's not really recommended to, to go to all these ones. The main ones to look at are the bottom two, which is the ones with Moodle in them, and the one is just uh, is active Moodle courses, and uh, this Moodle by term graph. I'll just go to this one first, and depending on your access, uh, it should already be linked to to what, what to all the information that you've got access to. So you're not, if you're in whatever faculty, you'll, you should have access to that faculty only. And so you don't have to go and select your faculty. Or, um, so the first thing, you can select a, a semester. So I'll just hit, uh, select, or you can add a semester. I'll just um, keep uh, that, semester two. And you'll see that it'll actually just generate a report um, well, it's, it's still processing, and sometimes it can be a bit slow. But, um, you'll see it's actually only got one course, and that's actually the course I teach. So, um, <laughs> um, so that's uh, the problem, but it should actually, this, this one is actually a, 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 just a, a table of data that t tells you what course, the course, the, um, and it just gives numbers for 
for access of different things. I'll show you the other report. One of the problems with uh, Power with Julia is that it can be quite slow to uh, navigate. problems actually even getting to, <laughs> let me get back to the main page. I wanted to show another um, one which actually shows graphs of um, all the tools that are being used, and that does it by course, by course basis. Um, so at least I could show you one example of how my course um, ran. Let me just try it one last time. I won't spend too much time on this. See if I can get back to the, the main page. If I see if this works. Okay, there we go. So that one. Okay, so this one is uh, two graphs, uh, logarithmic scale and, uh, and a, just a general count scale of how many hits we've had. Um, and uh, so you can actually generate these types of things for every course. So you can see. Uh, uh, so the different, this is just the course access, which is always going to be the most. Then you've got, I've just dis I've picked discussion forums. I'm not really sure what the different thing is between discussion board and forum. Uh, but there are now listed as, as separate things. Pages, resources, blogs. And so you can actually see um, what types of things are being used and, and how and when, at what period in the course. So it also seems like um, at the beginning of the course, People are more active, and then it tapers off, and then maybe towards the end they quickly do something, and then um, and then when they get to assignments, they're not actually doing much on on the online. So at least it gives us a bit of an understanding of behaviour and and maybe how we can both uh, look at how students uh, use the tool as well as staff and how we can actually cater to do things, uh, cater, facilitate maybe these strategies that I talked about, that we were talking about before. Any questions? Nice to Yeah. How frequently is the time updated? <coughs> um, I'm not. I'm not too sure about about that. Um, I think the um, these these Moodle ones. I think are a bit more often. I, uh, I, but yeah, I'd be guessing. I'm not it's, even, it's weekly. Then. It's weekly. Yeah. Okay. That that first report that you showed us then that's going to be updated this weekend. The, um, okay. uh, the Moodle um, course tools by yeah. course tool usage. Yeah. So it's, it's weighted. And oh, it, it depends. That, that that one that particular one takes a weekend to, to update. But yeah, it's not one every time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Alright, okay. Well that's it. Thank you very much.
for giving us the opportunity to talk about this. And um, um, we'd be very interested to know if you've got any um, ideas. So we put up our questions first, I'm afraid. But I think Thomas's uh, presentation has actually started some of the conversation already because he's got some similar problems, I think. So we were wondering whether. So keep those in mind. I mean, what we're going to do is just quickly talk about our blended learning projects. So I don't know if anybody's heard about that, but I'll tell you what it is, tell, us, tell you what our strategy is, um, and maybe some of the problems we're already sort of um, hitting. But I've got next to me, I'm Rachel Thompson, as you probably know. Uh, this is Leela Azuz and Martin Perusio, our new educational developers, being brought in specifically for this blended learning project in Madison. So um, they're going to give you a little bit of a run through of what we've got to so far in terms of things like our new media room. So that sort of thing I think you might want to hear about. Um, you have a button. Press maybe press the thing, the dialogue box. And I'll press escape and maybe now the dance. Mm -hmm. Moving on. It is working. Really nice. Um, so you guys are probably pretty okay with what blended learning is. You know, it's sort of one of those things. Um, what we might just show is um, is, it, is it just me? Going all over the Just push the middle. Uh, okay. I'm just going to show you a lovely diagram which you borrowed from someone else. I think, what did you make this up? No, this is from a handbook from the. Uh, I rather like this, and I think you can see it. Is it too dark? Uh, it's got schedules and tunnels. It's much better. Thank you very much. Um, and the idea, of, the idea of when you do things synchronously or asynchronously, the idea that it can be facilitator-led or self-paced. Um, also, in terms of louder, louder. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I'm just recovering <laughs> two weeks of that. Uh, um, and also, in terms of whether it's online or offline, so those sort of ideas, um, and individual and group work in all of this. So it's the idea that if you're going to do blended, you've got to be able to touch all of that. Um, and the bottom sort of sums it up in the way that people sum it up normally with, you know, words. So this is sort of the classic definition is it's formal education, partly supervised, in a physical environment, but you're going to have that online as well. And it's the way that you actually work that the student's going to have control over how that works, but also that it's got to be connected um, and so it becomes integrated. And this is where people find it so hard. People say, well, I'm doing blended. I've got something that I've got my PDFs online. Um, and you say, well, no, that's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be much, much more than that. And as a faculty, um, we've got some uh, funding, and we're actually trying to actually blend the whole faculty, which seems a bit uh, crazy now that we've got to that point where we're doing it. Um, but we have two major undergraduate programs, medicine and exercise physiology. And we also have many uh, very big, large postgraduate courses. We also have some medical science courses, which are actually, uh, if in a way, sort of belong to science, but it's a sort of joint uh, degree that a lot of medical science students do. So we've got a lot of undergrad courses, which are sort of um, sit alone, but work with programs from science and med science. So we've got a lot of stuff to tackle. The idea is we've got two years, we've got two educational developers, we've got a new media room, we've got a Moodle group, a bit like your um, new Moodle group um, where we're going to have stuff but it's trying to get everybody in there so the strategy is basically uh, for us to go around talking to people <coughs> that's what we've started doing and that's what we've done so far um, to be honest um, we what we got started getting money we started talking about this a year about well about eight months ago we got money around July um, and we're already sort of backpedaling like mad and saying well we can't achieve everything what we're going to do is do as much as we can and try and get people on board. So rather than saying by the end of two years we can have all of this done, it's actually going to be more about um, creating a snowball effect, I suppose, or feeling that we might get to a point where it will just keep going. So the idea is to initiate it and carry on. 
So we're going to do evaluation and so on, and hopefully um, we'll get somewhere. So we'll be able to report back as we go. But, um, just to give you an idea, we're going to look specifically at technology today. And that's what I'd like to see. And there's our med yes. medical mm -hmm. media room. Thanks to We're going to skip down to the other end. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> and you can move up. So <laughs> I'm actually going to give a private tour later. And to John and Brian, but if any of you are interested in looking at the media room and the facilities that we do have, just contact me or Martin. Uh, what it is is that we've developed a room in the AGSM building on the second floor, and we have a variety of different equipment and software available to create sort of different um, opportunities depending on your skill level and your enthusiasm and all that to be able to create different types of blended and online content from videos to uh, scoring packages to just simple PowerPoint lectures to someone talking in front of a whiteboard and being videoed. There's a variety of different options and part of it is to sort of look at um, what the faculty member feels most comfortable with at first and then as they gain their confidence and as they build their skills, potentially we can get them to do even more creative things and uh, engaging things as well. So this is just giving you an overview of the room. Uh, and uh, we have a green screen, which is we were playing with yesterday, getting it uh, tested to make sure that everything goes through properly. Just the middle one, right? Mm -hmm. So this is just giving you an idea of sort of the equipment that's in the room. Uh, just the fact that we have, I think our camera looks sort of like that one there. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, Hmm? It's a side, it's a kind of yeah, yeah. Really. So look, it's that exact camera, and we have two of those, and tripods, and then we have uh, lots of software on the computers, all which is the next one. Um, microphones, well, you can see all of that. Um, but basically, what we're trying to do is to create sort of flexibility for the, the faculty members to uh, create in, in different um, outputs and formats and all that kind of stuff. Did you want to add? I was just going to say we're not going to we're not going to try and get everybody to fit the same model. Mm -hmm. We really are saying well, what is what will work for you, what will work for your discipline, what will work for this time particular, frame. you know, these students, what will work for the time you've got to put into it. So we really aren't going around and saying this is what you've got to do, this is your format and, and yeah. um, it's, it's going to be very much what they come with and we're going to try and work with them. So we've already Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Uh, just wondering, do you guys have a um, like a dedicated support person that just will wait around and right now? It's okay. <laughs> uh, so when somebody wants to use something, they go to you guys and yeah. book a time. And, yeah. Right. So right now uh, we've already ha we haven't had our official launch, but we've had about three people in there, uh, and sort of we are providing orientation, which our first one is tomorrow. Right. Yes. Tomorrow, and it's going to be. I already have six people booked for tomorrow. It's a small room, so. Uh, and we have a couple of sessions going in December and in January, and we'll probably be providing them less frequently, but throughout the rest of the year as well. Uh, and part of the thing is that we want people to be integrated into the room and get sort of an orientation of how to use the equipment, sort of the safety procedures, um, what's available to them, and go through a run-through before they actually can go and book it on their own. Because we don't want them to just go in by themselves and then be like, okay, so what do I do when I turn on the computer, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Little things like that. So we're providing that kind of orientation. Those that can't attend like an actual training uh, orientation, we, we do a lot of one-on-ones as well. So that is taking up. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just to time. add, um, obviously a big component of the project is the media room and creating videos and things, a lot like was mentioned in the first presentation comments earlier about having short little videos on how to do things, but also videos, introductory videos for the courses and um, content related videos as well, so snippets of um, specialists from the from professional practice coming in to give some demonstration of something as well to put up online. And we have been working closely with LTU and um, on the um, professional development side of um, training for the media room as well. Um, and I just the point that I wanted to make is that it's um, it is a big component of the project, as well as meeting one on one with individual conveners to talk about ways of using existing tools within the university and also tools outside of the university. But media and video and development of of, of 
those types of resources is quite central to the to the medicine blended learning project. Um, one thing I, I've done something similar, but the media stuff that I have is portable. Um, so I do training and then lend out the, the stuff. But uh, one thing that I found that's really helpful is recording the training a bit, yeah. so that you don't have to retrain people and you can provide them access after you've given them the training so that they can um, go back and, and review it when they actually do book the room. Yeah. Yeah. Especially since you have the equipment to do it. So. Yeah. <laughs> Just have one camera in the corner recording the thing. Uh, big breath. Yeah. Yeah, well part of the thing is also, it's the technology, but also teaching and showing people what's possible, because I think part of the thing is right now, a lot of people, sometimes when they think video, they think high-tech videos, and they think like, when I say animations, I think they're thinking like, you know, the avatar, and I'm not really talking about that, sometimes I'm just saying basic PowerPoint animations, or just learning how to chunk your information and break it down into mini modules or things like that, because right now, it's, there is a bit of a, I wouldn't say struggle, but you know, getting someone to take a one hour lecture and getting them to break it down into, into chunks can be somewhat of a, a challenge because uh, you know, it's a different way of thinking about how you're going to do it because it's no longer just a one hour lecture. It's like, okay, how are they going to watch this online? I did have someone tell me they do watch it two times speed, so that's why it's okay to put it 45 minutes. Oh. But yeah. they do that here. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's right at the top of our Yeah, so then I was like, oh, that's not an excuse really to make it 45 minutes. Yeah. But you know, little things like that, how do you deal with that kind of um, resistance? Yeah. And you know, those are sort of the little challenges that we're finding. Um, but yeah, so we have had a, a med ed, med tel, med ed? Med ed. No. Yeah, sorry, this is med tel, that's med ed. So uh, a presentation where we tried to show sort of faculty the different options that they can do with the media room. So we had just broken it down into, before it was videos, then screencasting, then interactive e-learning. So these are more SCORM packages. Um, I know we have two minutes. So I'll go quickly because I actually would like to get more into the questions. Would that be possible? No, that's right. We've talked about all Yeah, so these are the questions that uh, we have to ask you guys. So anyone who's already sort of been creating formats like this, what have you found most useful? Well, one thing I was going to ask you before, which I think I will answer the question you're asking. Uh, we're um, thinking about similar things, but we're at the moment pursuing an approach that's more um, more about the individual, so enabling these types of things in their office or at their home, not necessarily buying a cabinet, yeah. but, but things like campaign shipping, such as time captures, that sort of thing, because we found that it's difficult to get people formally into a space and do something that feels a bit yeah. heavy, whereas they're doing it themselves and they might be more likely to. Well, yeah, I was wondering if you had that as part of your strategy, just to kind of broaden it, or? Well, I know that. Uh, I know that the funding is not for buying specific licenses for people, and we are suggesting if you do want to go specifically to the school. Uh, I just had a meeting before now with someone that was very keen on using Adobe Presenter, yeah. um, but she didn't want to go to the media room. Yeah. So she wants to work in her office, and I understand that. So, uh, And it's a lot more comfortable. However, she was blocked by Zoe when we tried to do the trial yeah. version. So yeah. there can be those issues as well where we, we might have face some technical glitches, yeah. um, but what I have told her is go ahead and start storyboarding, build your stuff, and then if need be, and I want like to go in for the video recording or stuff like that, then I bring her into the media room. But the rest, if she can manage, she's going to look into get funding for her own uh, software, but I do find there are a lot of people that would prefer to work in this comfort of their own well, home and stuff like that. I the for choice we made in the end was kind of dictated by I guess numbers because what how many staff we got? Three hundred or so. And we were only really expecting to see a small percentage of them come and sit with us. So in the end, we kind of go for a distributed strategy with some centralised video type of thing. We think the centralised video part will grow, but hope, hopefully we'll get a, a wide dispersal as well of skills. We're keen to see what your outcome is as well. Yeah, exactly. The outcomes will be yeah. interesting to revisit in six months or a year yeah. and catch up. Also, the centralised model that we're really using with the room facilitates, I suppose, a more higher-end type of video, with yeah. green screen and yeah. switching between video and A little bit on that edge. So having yeah. the range of, of solutions for people, um, individualised as well as centralised, I think, is useful. Yeah. Yeah. For 
of studying um, different starting points. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I think they're both going to go forward a lot. I'm happy to talk to you, probably this forum doesn't present a long time, yeah. but to talk to you about your questions there because they're the same ones that we've faced yeah. and we've got traction on mm -hmm. you know I talked about that a bit later. <clears throat> I, I one comment I'd make about questions and I think is valid as someone who controls uh, my school's budget. <laughs> um, I think something we do have to recognise when people talk about being time poor, they are. And we're asking them to do things in addition to everything else they've got. So Certainly a strategy that I've used that has got people more interested, I can, I'll say to things like, well, if you'd like to do this, you give me an outline of what you'd like to achieve, I'll find some money in the budget to, for example, get a casual marker so you don't have to do your marking and whatever. We do have to recognise that, you know, A, we've got to support it. If we want yeah. people to do things, we've got to provide some backing and support for them. And I do think it's unreasonable for all of us to be, you know, wildly encouraging but at the same time, not recognise, hey, where are, and I know as someone who develops online materials, how long it takes to do it. So I think, you know, it's, that is a fundamental barrier that the university as a whole has to come to grips with. If they want this to happen in this sector, they have to fund it. I think yeah. we're lucky because we do have, um, we've got the project, and so that's coming from top down, but we've also got the schools, because I think yeah. without the schools, without heads of schools saying, this is what we want to do. So we've yeah. got one head of school who wants to blend everything. Exactly. So, if that's the case, you yeah. say, show me your money. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Quite frankly. Yeah. I, will, I will put something in here because it's been burning from the beginning for me. And that is, while we're putting emphasis on e-learning or blending, we're taking it off effective, engaging learning because we're looking at it there. And when, if you want uptake, Put the focus on effective, efficient, engaging learning, low and high tech, yeah. and speak, get, in, nice. yeah. get in to where their space is. And then you're saying what blended formats should we be most interested in developing? The ones that are going to give you the biggest bang for your buck, the ones where there's the biggest deficit in the current ways of doing things that could be overcome and stand as a shining light for others to say it's worth the pain. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think there's enough joy around this. This is an imperative that's come down yeah. onto everybody and everybody's under the weight of it. <laughs> You're not going to get good no. work or take up no. in that. So if we're charged with that, we have to change environment mm. you know and, and the joy that's no different to our learners in, in yeah. a learning environment so that would be my one comment there. that's good thank you we've had a lot we have had the pushback from a lot of people but we're also getting a bit of oh I see what you mean yeah, yeah maybe this is doable as well so it's you know it takes time hopefully we're going to take 10 years I think the thing with online though is that thinking about the fact that it does take longer to produce up the front end but it might I never want to say it completely because someone said, oh, well, I don't have to touch it for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. You know, so there are things like that where there is some like, time that it does require that some maintenance, mm -hmm. but it will take reduce some of your time. But then it depends. We have to also look at how we're going to then engage them in class. What we're taking out of class, how we're going to then bring it in to make sure that they're getting the proper learning that we're so that's also the challenge. Part of the readiness of people has to be about <laughs> understanding we're now in a con an environment of continual change. Yeah. So it's not about bedding it down and having it for 10 years. So we've got some minor work to do. Yeah, that's right. So we're going to be revising this every year and this is just the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We up to use your green screen, Jerry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have to go as well. Sorry, I've got to go into the interview. Thank you very much. Because right. I'm getting a little bit older, I've got to turn the lights on because I can't see the notes. <laughs> I've got the lights on. I do have one. These ones? Yeah. Hey, that's the obvious thing. Okay. Um, 
I'm only going to talk very briefly, and I haven't got a lot of slides, which is good because the time is short. Um, so I'm Andrew Chambers from the AGSM, and I'm just going to talk about the innovations we've been doing, and our model of development is obviously very different to other people's because we're not struggling in the same ways, and you'll see why when I talk about the developments. But who was here last year? At the thing. Yeah, good. Do um, you remember who spoke last year? Yes. Nick Wales, that's yes. right. And of course now he's head of digital innovation down in the ASB. So uh, one comment, and Nick said it a lot and so have other people, is that e-learning is the past and digital innovation is the new thing. So um, if you look in the business world, everybody says the word digital, they don't use the terms e-learning anymore. So it's just one comment I'll pass on. Um, now all I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through one slide of things that we're doing. Um, so Nick was the head of our program and, and the head of uh, the AGSM online, and now he's digital innovation. But coming out of all of that, um, and he's still running the um, what will now be a new MBA in technology, which was the old MBT. Um, coming out of that is a number of developments, and the first one that, that he's given me permission to talk about is the MBAX. So the Masters of Business Technology was an online degree, and um, Everybody on that program basically teaches online, three quarters of the courses online. The courses have been specifically designed and they use Moodle and we use Turnitin compulsorily and all those sorts of things. So we don't have the same type of challenges as you guys, I guess. But it really was a specialised MBA. And so what Nick did was he decided why don't we have more of these. So we're going to have three starting in the middle of next year, two to three in the middle of next year. MBA X in technology, MB, and that's the old MBT, the MBA X in change, which is the um, graduate certificate in change management, becoming a proper degree, and the other new exciting one with the centre of social impact, um, an MBA X in social impact. Okay. And they're going to roughly follow a very similar model with um, carefully designed and produced and developed courses that will use Moodle, probably use Turnitin and Compulsory and those sorts of things. So that's the first thing. And then there's these other things we're doing at the same time. So that's going to produce more degrees and more students hopefully and, and boost our numbers a bit. The next thing is a, a saving money initiative, which is the core content. So we've got all these MBAs and we already have several. We have MBA um, Executive, we have Full Time MBA, we have MBA Hong Kong, we have a whole lot of, we have the MBT, what they discovered was the content was actually in some cases common between the courses. And um, our degrees are more or less traditional distance based for most of them, and so there were big slabs of content, but the content was being reduplicated and reproduced and rewritten across the courses. Why, why do you have five finance courses? You need one set of common content. So there's a project at the moment involved in that. and. Um, I'm here representing the other people, and the other one, the MBAX one, talk to Nick if you want to know anything about it. But the core com common content is actually, um, it's quite typical in our, um, in our faculty or the AGSM, so that's being run by a project manager, so Sabina Sarah Magic. And she's working with other people such as Susie Longstar, if anybody remembers Bill Twyman, he was doing the content development and is now working in the central unit, doing the teaching. Uh, she's his replacement and she's been working with that, those people as well, along with a number of other people who are working on that. So they're getting the academics together, the authors together, to create one set of content that's going to be repurposed. Okay. Traditional materials. However, um, the next thing relates to that is that delivery will be via iBooks for some courses in the future. So there's another related project um, where they're producing iBooks, uh, or ebooks if you want to call them that. Um, and they're going to have more interactive elements. Bill did um, pilot that initially within the MBT, but it's now become a bigger project. Um, they're getting, uh, they're working closely in association with Apple to produce the books. And all of this is to reduce this. We used to have a thing, I haven't got one here unfortunately, but it's like a book like that. We used to send out content that was like 600 pages. And sometimes courses would have two big binders and they'd have to be reproduced and printed and sent out to people. So the idea is, why not go digital? Okay. 
I won't go into the ins and outs of why iVox versus something else or, or any of the other aspects of it. Um, if you want to talk to somebody, have a talk to Sabina, who you can contact through the AGCM offices. Um, and that will be rolled out in a couple of programs initially, but I'm not going any further because it hasn't been announced to students yet. I believe that's either next week or the week after. So I'm not going to give you any more surprises, but you'll, you'll be surprised with some of the other things that we're doing in that one. So um, that will be interesting. Um, the next one, oh, I should mention with that one, PDFs will stay. So MBT no longer produces anything on printed stuff and sends it to students. Uh, however, students can still order things through the printery, which I've just heard is um, changed from Xerox to another company, yes, in January. Um, so that could be a challenge. But we still produce PDFs, and every course will have a PDF, okay, so as well as an ebook, for various reasons. And I said it's quite an interesting project. Um, the next one, um, Moodle. So as I said, I guess the difference with our programs are, including the new ones going forward in the MBAX, the use of online is basically compulsory. So the MBAX is our online degrees. And I didn't mention it before, but it's we're trying to be the first GO8 with high quality MBAs that are taught solely online. You can get them at a cheap price, but we've heard various stories about the quality. So we're a GO8 that's doing it, hopefully the right way. So we're, we're going to use Moodle. We'll be developing the courses probably in a very similar way. So there will be discussion. The content will be given to them in another format. Um, and there'll be activities in the forums and similar things like that. So that's the thing. Will that be cheaper than a face-to-face? -face? Sorry? Will that be cheaper than a face-to-face? -face? I hadn't thought about that, but yes, you're probably right. At the moment, um, MBT still does run about 25% of the courses face-to-face. -face. So you usually have like three classes that are taught online, and then one class we taught face-to-face -face for Sydney-based students. Um, we don't know, no one's yet enrolled in MBAX. Some of the students are transferring from MBT to the um, MBA, MBAX technology. So we'll see how the enrolments go and what's, what's necessary in the ways to deliver them, I guess. But yeah, what basically, yes. Cheaper to students or cheaper to, to students? Uh, no, 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 the prices are exactly the same. Exactly. I was going to say, I doubt, I doubt we're going to get a drop in. Oh, I, 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 missed, I missed the software team there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the, these prices are exactly the same. Remember, we're going for the quality. Nick's got a very good diagram. We're going for the quality end of the market. <laughs> In other words, people would be Well, it's a business degree, so. <laughs> they automatically have in some ways big pockets. But yeah, they, they, they do pay for these things for a reason. I'm not going to go into whether that will work or whether that won't work, because that's, that's a very valid question. Um, now, in relation to that, so, so Moodle will probably say very similar. And, and like you, I've also seen data out of out of cat eye, for instance, which is one of the things we use, which I'll get to in a second. Um, I won't say this officially, but unofficially, I would say students are starting to compare what's happening in the online environment in our courses, but possibly elsewhere in the university, and they're comparing it to what they're seeing in real life, mm -hmm. social media, mm -hmm. yep. and it's coming up wanting. Mm -hmm. okay. So I have seen that recently in the data, and it becomes more and more obvious over time. Um, so something's going to have to change in the way that the Moodle is delivered. Maybe it'll go more towards the use of the iBooks. One thing the iBooks are not doing, they're not delivering through iTunes U. Um, instead, I believe well, it still hasn't been, hasn't been announced, but I think I'll be using the um, Cloud Store, which is that central system that's used on the backbone, um, partially because you don't really want to duplicate Moodle. Okay, and also, um, iTunes U has very rudimentary um, administration back end. Um, so adding students to it and all that's all manual and it's, it's not nice. So some things remain. Um, another thing we're doing, which isn't on any of these slides, but another major project which hasn't started yet, but which is sort of in between the two, um, but related to assessment, is electronic exams. So another project which is about to start, be a big one looking at how do, once again to save money, but at our end, um, is how do we how do we stop having um, exams on paper, and how do we go to electronic exams? Whatever that might mean. MBT has always been uh, or has been for the last two or three years allowing students to take an electronic device, so they can take in any device to an exam, 
whether it's an on-campus exam or whether it's an invigilated exam or a supervised exam in their workplace, um, as long as it's not connected to the internet. Okay. And we use Turnitin in a compulsory fashion, so theoretically we can check the plagiarism and, and cross-cheating and people talking to each other, that's the theory. Um, so that's another project, and that's yet to be planned. Um, the next bit relates to all of that. Um, this is this is these four, five, and six are the bits where I'm mainly involved. Five um, quality assurance standards. So I'm going to be um, putting together guidelines for the new programs to do with um, accreditation. So. Business schools are typically accredited, yeah, okay. But typically accredited, so I'm going to be working on that bit and making sure everybody uses the same standards for that. CAT I, um, there's different standards of end of year course evaluations that's going to have to be looked at. Plagiarism processes and those sorts of things, I'm also for the MBT in charge of, so that will be another thing that goes into the MBAX as a standard. And theoretically, should filter across to the other existing programs. Like that's what I'm hoping. Um, next bit, uh, I'll just mention it briefly. Studies strategies tutorial, some people will have seen this, I've given some people access to it. There's a uh, one course in the program which is an introduction to management in MBT which has a study skills component as part of an introduction to management, but this is a separate tutorial which is a lot like a MOOC, um, I call it a LOOC, it's slightly different, but it's a, um, a large open online course, it's not a massive one, but it's got about 1500 students in it and it keeps expanding across the programs and it's a study skills or a study strategies tutorial. Um, and I'm doing this very similar things to some other people, trying to make use of adaptive e-learning and those sorts of things, but it's quite a challenge to rebuild it. But it's heavily content driven, um, it's heavily, heavily focused on the students going through it by themselves, it's self-paced. So I'm looking at those sorts of things. Um, and I, I guess if I was to describe it, it's a form of curated content, so I grab piece of people's content and make this into a course. And I also, the re other reason why I run that is because I teach um, study skills courses um, for the MBT students at the start of the semester. Um, the last thing that's happening is there's now one AGSM, which is a, um, a changing around of the way the AGSM is structured. Uh, and also there's a new central e-learning team, which is made up of a number of us. So Army does Moodle support along with Pratt. Uh, myself, who does mostly the quality assurance and the dev stuff, um, and Susie, Bill's replacement, and and of course the um, studio team, the design team, who do development of the resources and are doing development of the iBooks and iPads. Any questions? Any questions? Hopefully I've mentioned enough names, but if you want to contact, <laughs> contact anybody to talk about any of these things other than me, I can um, put you in touch with people. Uh, Anybody else think we're doing iBooks or iPads? Do it really? It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> we'll wait for you. Been there, done that. Yeah, you got it. Teddy shows how to do it when you're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I couldn't show you even the example because it's sort of basically a bargain until in a couple of weeks. Yeah, just a question with iBooks. Um, what about, and I'm just putting my black hat on here, um, what about the students who don't use Apple products? Ah, uh, wait for the announcement in a couple of weeks' time. Okay. Um, yeah, that's. I'll yes. get an iPad. Try guess. <laughs> 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 you don't need to I can't comment. Are you, are you allowed to put a requirement on students that they have a specific device? Um, remember, they're also getting a PDF. One, yeah. But remember, they're also getting a PDF. Part of their fees. They've still got the PDF. That's what I think. That's what I think. Not as reactive. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm jumped into it. So, hi, I'm Danny Carroll from the Business School, uh, along with uh, Peter McGuinn. We're the other half of the AGSM. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, anyway, I want to give you a quick summary of things we've done this year. I think stuff about strategy will come out as we go along. So the slide I just uh, skipped over was um, a picture of our lovely learning spaces on the ground floor. Um, so we've refitted our ground floor as uh, high-tech, uh, active, activity-centered classrooms. Uh, so that's part of a big strategic initiative around flipped learning. And in terms of uh, learning and teaching support, Peter and I have had a very, very big part in taking that forward. 
So it's been quite interesting that our involvement in the end, even though we're educational technologists, has really been a lot about learning design and curriculum redevelopment. And of course, you know, it's a, it's a big area, but we've been quite happy with that. We kind of took the approach that in the first year, because it's going to be a multi-year process, in the first year we were going to strike the balance in terms of staff support around curriculum redevelopment. And just in terms of technology, just get them being comfortable at a fairly basic level. So while there's a big technology edge to this project around you know, repurposing of materials, pre-recordings, using the technology in the room, in terms of our professional development, staff support, and also all the stuff on the community of practice side, um, it's really been, most of our efforts have been based around helping people change their practice, to redesign their teaching, to take themselves away from the lecture format and design good learning activities and, uh, act, and uh, tasks and so on in the space. So that's been quite an interesting uh, outcome so far. We've been two semesters in now in those four rooms and we've done surveys of the students and the staff and I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we've learned from the students. All right, so this is a little bit hard to see, unfortunately. Um, but we've done a really big survey instrument with like 35 items. And I'll probably have to go a bit as close to tell you what it is. Uh, the good news is, <laughs> as evidenced by kind of this, if you can see these green blotches, that's at the agree, strongly agree end. Okay? And they're green because they're the biggest numbers. So we asked the students things like, are you enjoying it? And 78% said, yeah. And are you, are you making friends? You know, because it's, you're talking to people. And they went, yeah, really good. And uh, what else did we ask them? Oh, did the academic give you pre-class learning materials? Pretty much. So on that level, all the indicators are quite good. But, but what we have seen is it's not a universally bright picture. And we're not too worried about that. In fact, some of these things were kind of expected. But we have, um, I think the second semester, we have about 14 different courses in these learning spaces. And a couple of these courses are courses where students are very heavy on maths and quantitative skills. So very operational, very traditional subjects, accounting, uh, economics 1200. And in these ones, we're seeing the strongest negative reactions from students. And that's been pretty similar from semester one to semester two. We see it in all courses, maybe about five or ten percent of students saying, we don't get this and we don't buy it. So there's something there, there's a lot there we have to learn, but there's a special problem around some particular types of courses that are very mechanical and very operational. And we're really discussing about where we go with those courses in the future. We've tried to rejig them, we've tried to rework them, we're doing interesting things I think with the academics, but we're only budging those numbers slightly. And it's also reflected in the students' uh, qualitative feedback. So it's a really quite a big survey. But in the qualitative feedback, the students who really hate active learning, really hate it. <laughs> I can't believe the teacher's not teaching you anything. Why am I talking to a bunch of young students? They don't know as much as I do, blah, blah, blah. We get all sorts of, but again, it's kind of a 10, 20% thing. So we can do the model better, but there's also something that we have to understand a lot better about our students. Um, the reaction of the staff has been quite good uh, in general. Uh, most of them are really enjoying, you know, being able to observe the students working. You know, if they've done it right, they feel that the learning has become visible, they're watching the students learn, they've got high contact with them, they can give them a lot of feedback on the guard. So there's many, many positives from the teaching point of view. So we'll keep you informed on that and, and we'll get people to, we'll do an unfed thing next year in the spaces and talk about that in a lot of detail. And in the uh, slides I'll circulate, we've made a couple of nice glossy videos, like we did in the business school, there's so much money in <laughs> with our students. And you can listen to them and the staff talking about their experiences. They're quite lovely. Uh, a couple of other highlights of our year. Every, uh, every year we run um, an e-learning academic showcase, and this year was our biggest one yet. It's the fourth one. We had about 80 or 90 staff come along. And along with our e-learning committee, because we're actually quite a big community, of educational developers, designers, and support people in um, e-learning and business. Um, we have an e-learning committee. Uh, we do lots and lots of training and professional development and all sorts of levels and so on. And 
the showcase where we get academics to talk about what they did during the year and what worked for them is really a nice part of our life now. I encourage other faculties to think about doing that, getting your best people together, putting you know a big show on if possible. That's great fun. Uh, in terms of our blended learning strategy, it really still revolves primarily around Moodle. So at, we're a face-to-face -face at the undergraduate level especially. We're primarily a face-to-face -face thing, but we want to design for really good blended experiences and really integrated uses of technology in many, many ways. And so while Moodle is the centre piece of our strategy and really is continuing to grow, at the same time we want to cater for diversity. Diversity of use, diversity of applications, tools that are best fit for purposes. Now in terms of going forward, if we think of the Moodle integration, I'd like to give you a quick visual picture of three parts of a quadrant of four. And I think the Moodle integration has already moved through three phases. Uh, I think it's been extremely successful on the idea of we've got it, it's stable, it's been well accepted by staff and students, and on that basis its use is growing, and I think it will grow in uh, potential and so on. But but probably, and we've got a lot we can do on that third quarter as well. We can do a lot of things to shout the really, really good features of Moodle. And it's great to hear people talking about faculty approaches to requiring people submit through Tony. I think we haven't done that yet. I think we should. It'd be really, really good to say well, this is it. School based or program based or faculty based uh, approaches right now, I think it would be great. Just in the final quadrant, maybe. When Moodle was coming to the horizon, one of the, one of the great selling points for it was that we would have, uh, and, and the, probably the second one as well, is we're very pleased about Moodle's ability to uh, be customised, where we have terrible troubles with Blackboard in that respect. It's been a real improvement. But in the last quadrant, Moodle was also sort of prophesied to be uh, a system that other systems would be able to connect to and hang off and plug into. And I think that's the great dream of everybody is, is it the hub or is it another nub? Not quite. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but it's the holy grail for sure. And that's where Moodle or some super system, everybody dreams of the one ring to buy them all. That would be really cool to get there. Um, so I want to talk for a couple of minutes about things that are not so familiar to other people in the room. Moodle's well known. We all understand its central role. But in the faculty, we, uh, we use a software called Review and also a School of Art and Design, where it's gone viral and is now in 90 courses, I believe, and a lot more courses than we've got it in. So, well done. But I want to talk about a couple of slides in relation to Review, which is criteria-based assessment system, in relation to how we use it for assurance of learning and how we've observed it's efficient <coughs> and has been good for the student experience. It's a Z-based login system. Uh, we got it initially because it can track data, and it can track data to produce cuts in these buttons, but this one, this, one, uh, this button here uh, runs a graduate attribute report for university graduate attributes. Uh, this button here produces a program learning goal report for our degrees. Uh, that button there produces a criteria report for students' performance uh, criteria by criteria in tasks. And all the data that we collect in review comes out nicely in terms, very quickly in terms of graphs of either a student's or a tutorial group or a course or a group of courses performance against university graduate attributes or program learning goals or, or task performance. So in this way, it's a really, really integrated and quick way to track data over time. So that's what we use for our assurance of learning reports to our accrediting bodies, Equus and um, the other people. But the interesting thing a lot of people don't know about review is that students also can get very similar reports out of review. So they can track their performance over a year or two, or in a course over all the tasks, or in a particular task against uh, graduate attributes, or in a course against the program learning goals like communication or teamwork, or ethics, they can get a self-report at the course level, or in a particular task, they can see their performance level against criteria, get their feedback, and export that to a PDF. So the system has got a lot and a lot of things to offer in terms of feedback to students and feedback and data to course program directors and so on. So, 
Oh, right. And this will lead to a video where staff and students talk about, you know, how, how, uh, how good it is to work inside and so on. So it's a system that's not widely understood outside of our two faculties, but we're really, really happy to talk to people about it because uh, there's nothing stopping other faculties using it, apart from a little bit of money, a little bit of commitment, and having enough uh, staff, I guess, How central much staff. Money? Eh? How much money? Not much. <laughs> Pretty cheap. Oh, I don't know. Um, what's, our, what's our... It's probably around... What did we work out here? $12 a head, something like that? $8 a head? Way less than that. It's, it's, it's at a scale. It's a sliding scale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got a few dollars per student. A few dollars per student. We've got a we've got a we've got a faculty license for twenty thousand students, and we've had it for four years. And so, yeah, the price is coming down. Eight dollars a student. Maybe. But certainly, there's nothing stopping other faculties using it. There's no. Uh, if you want to talk to us later, we'll tell you tell you more about it. It's great in uh, the first few courses as well for moderation. Staff have been using it to actually have those discussion around criteria. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Danny, also, can you give me this um, presentation? I'll put it up on the end. Absolutely. Are they all these? Yeah. Are they all on this? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just very briefly mention that for a couple of years we've been running a students at risk process that's based around data collection. And anybody who's going into the area of learning analytics around student academic performance or identifying students at risk or uh, I guess querying university databases should have come and have a chat with us because we've got some experience now in this area. Um, what we did initially was we did a dashboard like this with lots of colours, but basically we harvest data from the LMS, from students' arrival data, uh, from their um, academic history record, and bring it together and crunch it into risk numbers. And we interrogate it through our CRM. So we've got a process where we interrogate courses on that. We only really use it in core first year courses, but from that we get a profile of students who we think are at risk at week three or week four, and we contact them via mass email mail outs. What do we do then? We don't really do enough because we don't have enough staff resources. It's kind of a stage one or two thing, but if you're going down, if you're looking at learning analytics or students at risk, come and talk to us because we've got a couple of years experience in that, but some of the questions come up. Uh, so 2015 and beyond, Pete, uh, just maybe the first thing to say is um, our team is expanding. We're going up to three educational designers in the business school. And that's something I wanted to say is that the faculty has got a commitment to really supporting um, the integration of technology, blended learning uh, at, a, at a pretty high level. And I just wanted to put that out there because, you know, if you come from other schools and you feel you're under-resourced, I think it's a good thing to bring up. You can point to business and go, they've got so many people! <laughs> business they're really taking it seriously so what's the strategy obviously we're well resourced we want to we want to be with our people we've got lots and lots of different wheels turning we're not going to make people do blended learning approaches but we're going to help them do it well so um, Peter, is there anything you want to add just as a 2015 obviously and flip classroom will be a very big thing with us next year yeah that's that's one of the main focuses but, yeah. but i think We've been learning in the last six months that the use of the term flipped classroom is getting a bit tired and yeah. it actually means a lot more than just the traditional flipped classroom. Yeah. A lot of things hang off that, like blended learning, experiential learning, um, you know, repackaging content. There are a lot of things that fit into that flip model and we're, we're, we're trying to pursue a lot of different avenues around that core concept and perhaps stay away from the term um, exclusively uh, flipped classrooms. But, yeah, it's, that's the direction. Listen, Elizabeth's just going to do the final one. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to go over by 10 minutes, if you're okay with that. Just... Okay. Still lots of food over there. Go and grab some eggs if you're fading. Or... Okay. Thanks, um, Danny and Pete. Thank you. So, I'm Elizabeth Rossell from Foundation Studies. Yeah. And um, I hopefully won't go back here. What I'll do is... Just let you know that I'll uh, leave this presentation um, yep. link with you so it can be put up onto Moodle and you can have a look at it as you wish. 2014 for Foundation Studies has been a perfect storm. We, I left here last year on a really optimistic note because we have come to the tipping point and we tipped over into really optimistic um, futures. And then what happened was a whole range of things. And so I'll start just down here. I'm not going to zoom and do all that stuff. I'll tell it 
as it is, our numbers without any sort of indicator really went up 40% and that's year on year because they went up 40% last year. So we're actually looking at massive numbers and what that has done for us is it's placed enormous strain on resources, it's revealed some of the cracks that we were able to accommodate at lower scales um, and it has also led to the business rethinking the, the whole structure. But on a very basic level, it meant we didn't have enough rooms to put our students in. We didn't have enough things like um, the labs, the computer labs, um, staff, you know, staff we can get can we train them in time, you know, to be effective? So we, we had quite a lot of challenges. Um, tussling with the university around what spaces might become free that we might be able to take on. So in some ways, this growth has been really painful. In another way, I'm, I'm on this end of it, and we've managed it, and we've managed to create some really great opportunities that have pushed, pushed forward the learning and teaching agenda because you can't manage in the old way when you're um, undergoing such massive change. So our growth is mainly in China, no surprises there. Probably the surprise for most of us is that China's demand for the softer subjects is increasing. So design, although it's a small base, massive increase in the demand both in China and here. So China is wanting to study in country and wanting to study here. So something to keep an eye on, you know, as we go through. Commerce has been the biggest growth, um, but science is catching up, and I'd expect with some of the um, changes to. The visa rules, you know, particularly around accounting, we'd expect a little bit more of that to come. So we got an opportunity then, without much time to really think about it, but to create some new learning spaces. Temporary and then, so we've had to outfit the blockhouse and, and we have to now outfit two floors of the L5 building and we had to put some new labs in. So what we did in a very quick space of time, um, we had a look at the technologies. So whiteboards, interactive whiteboards are out. Inner interactive data projectors, working beautifully. Uptake's great. You know, it, it's unobtrusive. Last year I talked to you about a technology survey and the technology survey writ large don't give us stuff like IWBs and big technology. Give us, I call them FWBs, but in the interest of political correctness, they've now become VWBs. So very big whiteboards and lots of them. And, and I think this respecting that is at the heart. Don't push, we didn't push ahead with the big technology and you throwing e-learning down the throat and all that stuff until we'd address the basics. So people were saying, great technology survey, don't want the technology. <laughs> we want whiteboards. We want lots of them. We, okay, we heard you. Let's put in lots of whiteboards. <laughs> now you're gonna come play the technology, and they did. So that's a really good thing. Um, we, we targeted with our new teachers getting some younger, um, earlier career teachers who were a little bit more innovative and a little bit less afraid of the technology and that's boosted the change champions pool to really good effect because we're getting lots of the things that were being talked about where people are spontaneously um, creating little instruction videos and we talked a lot around what are your threshold concepts what are the things you're not able to solve in the way that our programs are structured let's target those okay our artifact growth this year has been amazing um in amongst growth 
yeah, the uptake of Moodle. Now, up here with Moodle, I actually called that Moodle Madness. I was really positive last year. Yep, we're there at tipping point. This is fantastic. We got there. It's been a nightmare. But only administratively. For whatever reason, UNSW Academic Admin has not been able to solve UNSW's um, enrolment. So we get all students in all courses. And remember, I was at, we were at the tipping point. People were ready for online assessment and started to dabble. They were ready for groups and groupings and all those things that it offered. And then we got into this year. And it was like, uh, sorry, you're supposed to have 300 people in that course and you've got 1,800. Good luck with that, figuring out who you're meant to be marking and who's in. So it's been a nightmare. The good thing about having reached tipping point, people are taking it in their stride. Where before it was an excuse to hide, now it is, okay, how are we going to do this? So that's a really positive thing. I'm really proud of them and the way that the staff and the way they've handled things because they haven't fallen over even though significant barriers. I've been tearing my hair out um, trying to get it to work. We're now at the end of the year and it's still not working. Anyway, that's my little thing. Okay, the other big thing that's come about uh, in playing with the learning spaces is staff and students. In one, we did a flexible lab, flexible learning lab, um, computing lab. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. It's that joy. Everybody wants to use the room, <laughs> students and teachers just love it. So that's something that we could talk about at some other time or you can come down and have a look. Um, at the same time this is happening, massive restructure. And nobody has known really where that restructure is going. But this perfect storm has created an environment in which things that we haven't been able to progress in terms of resources Suddenly, we've got a platform, we've got new ears. Yeah, we, we can actually make cases and have those cases heard. So we're, we don't know the shape that that restructure is going, except that UNSWIL, the Institute of Languages and Foundation, have now been brought together as one education group under a single management structure. And we will be restructured you know, into next year. But what it's doing is making us rethink the way we're doing some things and looking to leverage this opportunity to make some more fundamental change. I'll come back to the beginning of, uh, well, the end of last year's. I still think we've got to be talking about teaching for learning, not e-learning, <laughs> not taught. Mm -hmm. you know, not only is that, it's really having a look at how do we enable great efficiency and effectiveness and rewarding experiences for students and for teachers. And I, I really want to put a plea to Unfed. Technology is important. It's a tool. But unless we get our agenda <coughs> right, we're going to be dragging them, kicking and screaming. Okay, cheers. Any questions? So just want to um, echo that closing point a little bit. It's more, more and more of our role is sort of kind of drifting into the educational development, learning, design, curriculum development aspect of our jobs. Technology it's deeper. It's just a gradual shift. We've said it for a couple of years. It's a holistic endeavour. It's a holistic you know, endeavour. I don't yeah. want to go to a doctor who can only see my left finger. Yeah. You know, he has a whole lot else that's going on to it. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you have problems with it. Well, listen, guys, thank you very much. Uh, have a fantastic Christmas. I'd just like to say one thing. We go, actually, a few things. Please take some food, number one. Number two, this video and everything else will go up on Unfed uh, um, website. And the other thing is, Russell is leaving us. Yeah. Oh. Um, this is last day today, so. Russ, I'd just like to say you've been a little bit of kind of a mentor to me a little bit uh, last year. You, you were always the one in the meetings that asked the most pointed questions. So like, oh, wow. He's really, this guy really knows what he's talking about. So anyway, good luck. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks very much. And thanks, thanks to Learning and Teaching for backing.
attacking us again. Oh, yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> and Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah.